This is the Wow Signal, a production of the Dream of the Open Channel. It's August 2014, and this is the Season 2, Episode 4, Cells, Planets. Welcome. This is your host, James Garrison. In this episode, I'll be speaking to Dr. Stephen J. Dick. And a little later, Paul Carr has an interview with young astrobiologist Batul Kajar, who brings her training as a microbiologist to bear on the questions of astrobiology. Astrobiology is an area of science that is just starting to come into its own and gain some real scientific respectability. People come to astrobiology from a broad range of backgrounds to ask and answer some closely related questions, such as, under what conditions can life, as we understand it, originate? What are the constraints or general principles that govern the evolution of life? How unique is the Earth? Are specific environments that we know something about, say Mars or Saturn's moon Titan, places where life may have originated or could originate? What exoplanets are most promising as a home for life, and how can we search for it? Last season, in episode 4 to be exact, we interviewed astrobiologist David Grinspoon, a protege of Carl Sagan, who came to astrobiology through planetary science, in particular the study of the planet Venus. In this episode, we are going to meet two more astrobiologists with very different backgrounds. I was very fortunate to be able to speak to Dr. Stephen J. Dick. He is currently the Barack S. Bloomberg NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology. He was an astronomer and historian for the U.S. Naval Observatory and later became the chief historian for NASA. He's written many articles on the importance of exploration, as well as writing some of the first scholarly articles on the topic of astrobiology. His knowledge of history and astronomy have given him some very interesting ideas concerning the ways in which life may have evolved on other planets, and the ways humans may continue to evolve. His ideas about a post-biological universe are extremely fascinating and have definitely changed my views of what extraterrestrial life forms might be. Also in this interview, he briefly talks about cosmotheology, which is the view that theology should be based on the knowledge that we have. And now, here's Dr. Stephen J. Dick. This is James Garrison for the WOW Signal Podcast, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Stephen J. Dick, who is the Chair in Astrobiology for the Library of Congress. He is also an astronomer and historian for the U.S. Naval Observatory, on top of publishing a great many articles. Is there anything you'd care to add to that? Well, I was... uh... I was actually I'm not at the Naval Observatory anymore. I'm now uh, I was the chief historian for NASA, uh, okay. and I'm now at the library. You are the second chair right. of astrobiology for Library of Congress. That's right. Uh, for 2014, the first one was okay. David Grinspoon uh, last year. And I had been matter of fact today. I just seen where as he was outgoing and you were coming in, you had a conference on the uh, concerning astrobiology. That's right. Uh, that one had to do with uh, very, a very very general kind of subject uh, having to do with the longevity of civilization, you know, the problems uh, that we have uh, on uh, climate change and that sort of thing. And I'm going to be doing a one in September um, uh, called Astrobiology and Society, which has to do with what I'm working on this year at the Library of Congress, which is the uh, impact if we discover uh, life okay. beyond the Earth. Uh, now, do you ever uh, do the two of you still work together on occasion, or 
Yes, we do. He's uh, still in the office right next to mine. Uh, he's working uh, on finishing his book, and I'm about in the middle of my book. So we, uh, it's great that we, uh, <laughs> we're both uh, together there uh, and, and can uh, bounce okay, ideas off each other. Now, I was looking, and you have uh, spoken in the past about the post-biological universe. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, you want me to talk about that? Just as a little bit of disclosure, I, I am fascinated with astronomy, astrobiology, but I am a complete layman when it comes to knowing the details on anything. But yeah, if you could discuss the okay. post-biological universe and possibly uh, cosmotheology also. Right, okay. Yeah, the uh, well, the idea of the post-biological universe is that... Uh, you know, uh, the universe was uh, began with a Big Bang about uh, 13.8 billion years ago. And uh, life could have started, you know, billions and billions of years ago, intelligent life, uh, so that there could be civilizations out there that are much, uh, much older than we are. And, um, you know, if you take uh, uh, evolution seriously, everybody talks about, you know, astronomical evolution, the uh, evolution of uh, astronomical objects, and biological evolution, but there's also cultural evolution. And uh, one of the things uh, on the Earth where cultural evolution seems to be leading is towards artificial intelligence. And uh, so my point uh, in the article that I did uh, on the post-biological universe had to do with uh, the uh, idea that uh, other cultures out there would have developed uh, post-biological intelligence over the long term, and that, uh, uh, you know, if we find life out there, it might be artificial intelligence or machine intelligence rather than just biological okay. intelligence. sort of where we seem to be heading now in terms of the neurological developments and the more mind-controlled cybernetics that they're coming up with? Well, that's right. Of course, there's a controversy about this. Uh, you know, some people, uh, like the philosopher uh, John Searle, thinks that... Uh, you know, you can't make uh, intelligence uh, artificially to the same level as humans. Uh, but other people, like uh, Kurt, Ray Kurzweil, um, who wrote a book called The Singularity is Near, believe that, uh, you know, eventually uh, humans will be phased out and uh, and uh, you'll have um, uh, machines taking over artificial intelligence because they'll be smarter than we are. Uh, so uh, that's a theme that you see in science fiction sometimes, too. But Kurzweil claims that it's... Uh, Going to uh, going to happen on on Earth in the next few generations, which is either uh, popular yeah. or pessimistic. Okay. Depending yeah, on I know, your I point know some people <laughs> who are in favor of the singularity and who are greatly fearing it. Exactly right. But my but the point is that since we have civilizations out there that could be much older, it may have okay. already happened out there. And we would we wouldn't really have a way to recognize them as a living entity, would we? Well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, the, the SETI people, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence people, should be interested in this because uh, it's a question, if you're searching for machine intelligence, would it be uh, a different kind of a search than if you're searching for, uh, you know, a more human uh, humanoid intelligence? So uh, I think people need to uh, to think about that, how the search might differ if you were talking about uh, machine intelligence rather than uh, humanoid. Hmm. Which it sounds like it relates partly to the Fermi paradox, may also affect how they spread out from solar system to solar system. Well, that's right. The Fermi paradox uh, says just that, uh, you know, if there are so many civilizations out there, where are they? Why don't we have evidence of them here on Earth? Because you, they should have given a long time scale to the universe, the billions and billions of years they should have spread hmm. out and they should have been here on Earth by now. Which, you know, some of the UFO <laughs> people say, well, they are here on Earth, but <laughs> a lot of other people say there's not, not enough evidence for that. Uh, and so, uh, yes, it does have to do with the Fermi paradox, too, because if you have machine intelligence, uh, you know, they may not be on a, uh, on a planet that is, uh, uh, similar to ours. They could just be roaming around, you know, they don't need conditions like we have, but nice, nice, uh, temperate conditions, it could be roaming around, and then the question is how fast yeah. they would spread throughout. And the they'd be in, an, like you said, entirely different environment, so SETI may be aimed at the wrong air parts of the universe. That, that's right. Yeah, they, you wouldn't necessarily be looking at a uh, at an Earth-like uh, planet. Since you're but unfortunately, we have to go off of life as we know it. Well, yes. I mean, uh, it's a big enough search if you just uh, consider life as we know it, because it's a big universe, and they could be, uh, the, you know, the normal uh, SETI searches uh, are done with radio telescopes, and there are enough uh, frequencies, you know, it's like a radio with the... <laughs> 
10 billion channels and yeah, you've got to decide which channel you're looking in on. <laughs> confluence of choices. Huh. That's, right. I actually hadn't thought of – I personally never thought of an alien life form as being – instead of being some form of organic life as being alien uh, – robotic or information right well that's uh, what we have to do uh is to think out of the box i think there's too much in the box thinking you know when you're thinking talking about this sort of thing and we have to think out of the box and if you as i say if you consider the long time scales of cosmic evolution you have to think where cultural evolution might have led and even where it's beginning to lead here on earth you know so it could uh, it could be uh that, well be post biological that's going to give me something to chew on for quite a while <laughs> Yeah, I like uh, that. <laughs> that does. Okay. Uh, and then uh, yeah. uh, cosmotheology. That is. Yes. Well, that's uh, that's an article that I did. Uh, actually, I did a couple of articles uh, oh, 15 years ago now, and this began with um, what's called uh, the Templeton Foundation, uh, which is a, a dialogue between uh, science and religion, and uh, they held a conference way back in oh, 1998 or so, and there was a volume that came out of that which I edited called Many Worlds. Uh, the subtitle was The U- New Universe, Extraterrestrial Life, and the Theological Implications. And uh, the uh, particular paper that I did in there was called Cosmotheology. And uh, the idea there being just that uh, uh, if... Uh, uh, that, well, the idea being that you should take into account what we know about the universe in our in our theologies. In other words, probably we know that we're not central in any physical kind of way. We're not in the center of the of the solar system, we're not in the center of the uh, of the galaxy, and the galaxy, Milky Way galaxy, is not in the center of the universe. And it's possible that we're not central in any biological way either. We don't know that yet. That's what astrobiology is looking at. But uh, my point was that uh, we need to prepare uh, to change our theologies if we do, especially if we do find uh, extraterrestrial intelligence yeah, that would uh, life out there. Alter the viewpoints of a lot of religions. Well, that's right, and especially I think the Western religions, the Christian religions, uh, because there the issue is, and this has been talked about actually for almost 500 years since Copernicus, uh, if uh, you have life out there, then what does that do to uh, some of the Christian doctrines like uh, redemption and incarnation? You know, would you have a have to have a, a planet-hopping Jesus or that sort of thing, you know? Uh, whereas uh, some of the Eastern religions, which aren't so, so much involved with... Uh, you know, uh, a personal God and, and uh, that sort of thing might not be affected so much, but certainly in the West for the Christian yeah, religions, I think also kind of brings to mind the uh, one, uh, part where they say he made us in his image. That <laughs> so. Well, that's right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it, it brings up a lot of questions about uh, theological doctrines, and so again, my point is just that we need to think about that you know, before we find life, how it might affect our yeah. uh, our so uh, theology. Apply more of a naturalistic view to some of the religions. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a fair statement, so, right. While I was going through uh, some of the things that you've done, and as I said, you've done quite a bit, uh, I noticed that you had testified last year in December to Congress about the future of astrobiology and I believe about continuing the funding for SETI. That's right. Uh, you know, SETI was funded by the federal government up until uh, 1993, uh, beginning in the 70s and, and into the 80s. They built a program for search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, by radio signals, um, and that became operational actually on the 500th anniversary, sort of symbolically on the 500th anniversary of Columbus's uh, landing in the New World in October of 92. And uh, one year later, the whole program was canceled by Congress uh, uh, you know, they claimed it was for budgetary reasons and that sort of thing. And there's never been federal funding since in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, on the other hand, uh, NASA does have a strong program in astrobiology uh, in the sense of searching for microbes and, and um, uh, you know, more primitive life. So it just seems to me that there's a disconnect there that you can search for microbes and not go beyond that and search for uh, more intelligent life. And so that's what my uh, part of my congressional testimony uh, argued that uh, we really should, um, you know, have a program where we're searching not just for microbes but also for uh, intelligent life, um, or let's say more complex life. Recognizing that there are two different scientific communities, you know, the people searching for 
microbial life or microbiologists and uh, biochemists and, and that, th- those sorts of communities. And on the other hand, the people searching for radio signals have to be astronomers, radio astronomers, uh, engineers, and that sort of thing. So it is two different communities, but they're all um, they're, they're both looking for uh, for life. Okay. Uh, do you think there would be a chance for the possible? And I know that uh, SETI is public funded, a lot of volunteer and donations to it. Uh, but that's right. It's uh, you know Silicon Valley uh, funding and that sort of thing. But it's very uh, sort of uh, even so, it's uh, sort of shoestring and sporadic, and they have to shut their experiments down every once in a while because they just don't have the the steady uh, funding as they had when the federal uh, government Do you think there funding. would be a way for, like with how they're taking our the uh, U.S. space program into the private sector with the Dragon X and all the companies that are looking at mining asteroids, do you think there would be a way to tie SETI in with the private industries? <laughs> Well, I think it's great what they're doing with the you know the commercial uh, uh, side. Uh, on the other hand, uh, commercial uh, people usually are, have in mind trying to make money, and uh, you know you can make money uh, in some of those things, like in mining asteroids or even going to the moon and, and getting resources and that sort of thing. But it's hard to see how you're going to make money for other things like going to Mars, you know, which is uh, extremely uh, different than going to the moon. And uh, no, I, don't, I can't see that any company would ever make money going to Mars, or for that matter, for for uh, searching for life. So I don't think it's a good model for um, a, a SETI uh, funding, and that's why the federal government has to step in and do certain long-term things that you know a private enterprise would not uh, want to do because they're uh, they're not okay, going to make enough. money. I, it. I, I can see that. I just didn't. Know. You've got a you've got a more in-depth knowledge of it, yeah. so that's why I was. Was asking that. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah. Now on, and I know, I know, I am kind of jumping a little bit, but something you said about the uh, post biological development kind of piqued my interest. Uh, when it comes to right. when it comes to artificial intelligence and okay. the robots, uh, granted, mm-hmm. you know, if they if they have been around longer than us and have achieved that level of cultural development, how far develop, how far ahead can, do you think that they're artificial intelligence programs can become, or do you think that they're just, instead of developing a new AI for each robot, roughly, uh, do you think that they would be uploading their own consciousness into a cybernetic or fully robotic body? Well, of course, nobody knows. Um, uh, Kurzweil uh, is famous for, uh, he has this idea that you could up, uh, sorry, that you could upload uh, uh, you know your own brain into uh, into an artificial intelligence and become sort of become uh, immortal, uh, but uh, uh, it's hard to say because you, you're dealing with billions of years here, where, and you just don't know where cultural evolution could have led. Now, uh, uh, the reason I say uh, that there could be post biological intelligence is because uh, what I call the intelligence principle. If you think about how culture develops. Uh, over the over the long term, you know, um, intelligence has to be kind of a central driver of cultural evolution. The more intelligent, and you think in a kind of a Darwinian evolution way, that the uh, more intelligent uh, species uh, will, uh, you know, outdo the outdo the others and eventually take over. So, uh, intelligence in that sense, uh, uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's a, an upload or. Uh, independent development of uh, of artificial intelligence. As long as the intelligence is increasing, uh, you would think that that uh, is what that would be a, a main part of uh, cultural evolution. So that's well. Could that's there my be argument. a degradation of their intelligence? Like when you make a copy of a copy, or when you transfer a file, too many times you're going to get faulty data. You're going to get corruptions. So could that affect the chances of us finding a artificially intelligent alien life form. Oh, sure. The, uh, those are all uh, po- possibilities. Uh, uh, but when you're talking about millions or billions of years, you would think that they would have uh, uh, overcome <laughs> those kinds of problems. Um, you know, there's going to be problem, technical problems uh, in any development like that. But uh, as I say, when you're talking about over the long term, you would think that they would, uh, would have uh, solved those problems. And again, I would emphasize that... Uh, 
Uh, you know, some people think that it's not going to be possible to have artificial intelligence just in principle, that it can't be done. And that's uh, uh, perhaps a valid uh, point of view. But uh, it would seem like if you had millions of years to figure it out, that uh, that, that it could have developed. Yeah, I, I, can, I can see both sides of it. One of them that it's just impossible to mimic a living organism's brain to the full extent. But you can probably get very, very close, close enough to make them completely autonomous, capable of making their own decisions and basically creating a possibly even separate culture from the one that they came from. Right. Well, especially if you have millions yeah, of years of, uh, to, to do it in. So, <laughs> you know, you, you can ask where we're going to be in, in a thousand years, much less a million years, and uh, easily see that if it is possible in principle that we, uh, you know, we may not uh, – Humans, flesh and blood human beings may not go away, but uh, there may be intelligence, uh, you know, uh, equal to or greater than ours in uh, in the in the yeah, biological sense. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the development just in the time I've been alive, going from vinyl records to MP3s. If we continue at right, that well, rate, exactly, yeah. there's yeah. no telling. We may be the ones being found by a more primitive civilization at some point. Uh, that uh, that oh, could be. Okay. Yeah. Now, one question I've always had and I, I have spoken to a couple of people who are more or less astrobiologists. They're biologists who have the strongest interest in astronomy or vice versa. And right. one question because growing up read a lot of science fiction, Star Wars, Dragon Riders, things like that. And yeah. most people assume that just automatically that any life form we find is going to be carbon based. Do you think it would be possible for say a silicate based life form? Right. Well, there are two sides to that story too, of course. Uh, uh, some, uh, you know, very well known, uh, biochemists and biologists have looked into that and pointed out that, uh, carbon is by far, you know, the, the one element that is most able to form most bonds with other, with other kinds of elements and therefore develop the complexity that you need in life. And that certainly is what happened on the earth. All life on earth is carbon based. On the other hand, some people have argued that if you have the right environment, uh, you know, on a, on a planet or a, a satellite, uh, that silicon life uh, could develop. And that's why it's important that we find, uh, you know, that we search for life and, and see just what part of life is universal. Um, I just came back recently from uh, the University of Illinois where they have uh, uh, an entire institute called the Institute for Universal Biology, and they're trying to figure out what are the universal features of life. Uh, you know, that might be expressed, uh, not only here on the earth, but also on other planets. And they're, they are working mainly within the carbon, uh, uh paradigm, but, uh, you know, other people, uh, think that uh, silicon life might be possible. But again, you know, there's so much to look at in the carbon paradigm that, um, uh, some people say, well, we should just <laughs> concentrate on that and, uh, you know, keep an open mind about the others, but not okay. uh, spend money looking for so them. Go with, basically, once again, go with what you know. Right. You, you've you actually covered pretty much everything I was wanting to ask you. <laughs> uh, is there any questions that okay. no one ever asks you that you'd like them to? <laughs> well, uh, the book that I'm working on now has to do with, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the more of the humanistic aspects of astrobiology. There are quite a few people out there, research teams working on, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, technical aspects, the biological aspects and, uh, and, uh, uh, scientific aspects of looking for life. And what I'm doing is looking at the, uh, implications if we find life. So, you know, what the, what the main approaches are in terms of uh, how you can even uh, approach such a far out subject as what the implications could be. But, you know, we've done it, uh, in the past. There are other, uh, uh, science projects which look at the implications of what they're doing, like the Human Genome Project. And so I think in general, it's a good idea to, to do so, to look at uh, what the implications might be of, of what we're doing, including in astrobiology. Um, and I guess one of the things uh, that I've been looking at is, uh, you know, uh, how we think, think out of the box in terms of uh, not just life and intelligence, but also culture and civilization and uh, technology and communication, which are things that you get into if you're looking for extraterrestrial intelligence. And so I, uh, uh, you know, ask questions about how how you can uh, think about those things. And also, uh, I think one of the great things about astrobiology is that it makes you ask questions that 
and sort of generalize in a way that you wouldn't have uh, normally. Uh, for example, is our mathematics universal? You know, would, would extraterrestrials out there have the same kind of mathematics that we have uh, or not? Um, and would they have the same kind of science that we have or not? Uh, if, if not, then that's one answer to the Fermi paradox that you mentioned before, because if we can't, if they don't have the same science and math, then we probably can't would, communicate, which is <laughs> yeah, which one answer to the question why we don't see them. Sagan's golden record a really shiny wall hanging, too. Well, that's right. That's right. They may not have yeah, any... It's a large, heavy frisbee. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. I, I know that uh, with SETI and this just came to me they are looking for signs of relatively current life given the fact that any signals that they receive are going to be coming from light years away well that's right if you're uh if the civilization is 100 light years away you're seeing it as it existed uh, 100 years ago because you have no way of getting information any faster than that so if you wanted to answer them it would take another 100 years yep. for your your answer to get to them uh so that's right yeah the further away they are the more uh, the longer so has to, uh, anyone thought into, and I know it would be difficult to do with the current technology we have now, but looking into maybe developing a field of, say, astroarchaeology, kind of looking for past signs of civilization? Sure, people have talked about that. In a sense, it's all astroarchaeology. If you think of uh, you know the finite speed of light, uh, because in the example we just gave, you're looking at the civilization as it existed 100 years ago. Uh, but in the other sense, you're probably talking about, uh, the, especially the Russians have talked about astroarchaeology uh, in terms of finding uh, artifacts and that sort of thing if you actually are out there looking, you know, and and even in some cases uh, remotely uh, finding things like Dyson uh, civilizations, or you know, which is an infrared signal uh, indicating that, uh, uh, that a civilization has harnessed the uh, energy of its own sun and would be infra- radiating in the infrared. Uh, so when you see those in uh, those kinds of ideas, and yeah, the Dyson uh, spheres. Yeah. Unfortunately, okay. I don't think I've got any more questions for you right now. This this has been a lot of fun, though. I have really enjoyed it. I, I hope I hope you did too. Good luck with that, and uh, you know if you have any uh, questions about what I said, okay, you know, I, email I definitely me. will. Uh, and I'm really kind of looking forward to when your book comes out. So, yeah, yeah, so much. <laughs> After speaking to Dr. Dick, I got to thinking about the different ways life may have evolved throughout the galaxy. If we do discover life forms from other planets, who's to say that they're biological or carbon-based? They could be based on silicates. They could be cybernetic. They could be robotic. Until we discover something from another planet, it's difficult to say. His discussion with me has given me quite a bit to think about, and I hope it's done the same for you, too. And now here's Paul Carr with his interview with Batul Kajar. Thanks, James. Well, I'm glad I don't have to really actually name the most important person in history because I don't think there is one. But if you forced me to, probably the the name I would come up with would be Charles Darwin. The person who, not single-handedly, but as close to single-handedly as you could get, opened our eyes to the way the, the living world really works. A very, very different perspective than what we'd had before. And of course, like any really good idea, that leads to lots more and better and further research. It doesn't just stop there and that's the end of it. Darwin didn't know how evolution worked, actually. He didn't know about DNA. He didn't know about genes. He didn't know about really how the mechanism of heredity worked. Now here we are in the early 21st century, about 150 
plus years later. And we really do have a good grasp on, on the basics of that. And because we think that life, the evolution of life is going to happen in any kind of habitable environment where, the, where life originates, we want to understand, are there general principles that guide the evolution of life? There are people like Dr. Kajar who are studying this in a lot of detail, and I'm going to let her describe her research. It's quite complex what she does. Um, she is a NASA postdoctoral fellow. Uh, she works in Eric Goucher's lab at Georgia Tech School of Biology. Um, she is a, PH, a recently minted PhD and she um, is also, as you will hear, very enthused and excited about public outreach for science in general, uh, but also astrobiology. And she particularly wants to encourage women and girls to go into biology and astrobiology. Now, James, you might have noticed that uh, this is, I think, she's our third astrobiologist that we've talked to on this show. Uh, you just talked to one, Stephen Dick. Um the, the one, and you had uh, Grinspoon before that. And, uh, yeah, that's right. Now David Grinspoon uh, came to astrobiology from a planetary science point of view. He was uh, a Carl Sagan protege. Um, he was interested in uh, in Venus, uh, how, how the evolution of a plant, an entire planet. Um, Stephen Dick has a, a completely different background, as we've just heard, and finally. Uh, Dr. Kachar, uh, Batul Kajar, she's a, a microbiologist. That's her training and, and her PhD work. Uh, and so we have three very different backgrounds, all of whom call themselves astrobiology. So that That's typical of a field that is just coming together and starting to grow and mature. And I think it's very healthy that we have such a diversity. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is that uh, Dr. Kajar is, as you will hear, is the founder of Saganet, which is a new way for astrobiologists and people interested in astrobiology, including students, to network and find out more information. And I have found it to be an incredibly good resource for, for making contact with people in the field and who are related to the field who uh, – who can be on the show and it will be, and she is our first Saganet interviewee. She's actually one of the founders of Saganet, but, and she will not be the last by any stretch of the imagination. We're going to have a lot of people from Saganet on, uh, on the wow signal. I'd like to now introduce, uh, Dr. Kajar, who will tell us all about her research and also learn a little bit about Saganet and outreach. And I think that, Dr. Kajar herself may be a very fine spokesperson for astrobiology and for women in science in general. I want to ask you about your research, of course, but I'd like to start by asking you about a SegaNet. Mm -hmm. Which is how I made contact with you. Uh, I understand you're, you, you're, are you one of the founders of that or what? Can you yeah. tell me, tell me more about that, please? Well, uh, Saganet was, uh, actually, we initiated Saganet as an idea back in uh, 2011 after a very um, inspiring astrobiology uh, meeting at in, in Montana. Basically, um, Astrobiology Institute. NASA uh, Astrobiology Institute funds this. Uh, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with UpGradCon, uh, where grad graduate students and early postdoctoral scientists meet to uh, share their research. Uh, no senior scientists involved. Hmm. And um, we, we realized that all of us, other than finding astrobiology extremely exciting and interesting, obviously we're doing it, um, next thing we find most exciting about it is that we we like the impact it has in in people's lives, and the the biggest proxy that we have is ourselves. We all realize that astrobiology was the single component that really inspired us and changed our careers uh, for for you know, really good cause. Hmm. 
Hmm. And we realized that we we want to um, share our passion and astrobiology with the greater community, and especially for um, people with people who uh, can really benefit from it. Uh, realizing it is power, realizing the power of astrobiology, really, because it is it is a field that really goes boldly and asks the questions um, that maybe. Maybe it will never be possible. Maybe we will never know the answers to these questions, but it allows us to, you know, un- un- ask them, really gives us a platform to uh, ask these questions. So uh, we founded an uh, online mentorship and outreach and uh, community platform, and we named it uh, SegonNet right after, <laughs> after Carl, Carl Sagan. The, the, the man who changed it for all of us to be, be, to be specifically designed this platform to support the uh, STEM outreach activities uh, using astrobiology related focus areas. Um, so we have scientists and students and high school teachers and enthusiastic uh, anyone really who has any interest in science who are a member right now. We have over a thousand member currently. And uh, for one of our most uh, current and, I would say, successful activity, we uh, basically initiate and direct uh, activities to connect uh, middle and high school students with astrobiologists who want to uh, share their work with the, with the American youth. So uh, it, it, a big component is mentorship and a big component really is community outreach. Now, let's talk about your research a little bit. When I hear experimental evolution, I, I usually think of um, the experiments that have been done with, with yeast to, to change their metabolism. But this is what you do is quite different. Can you tell us how you do experimental evolution? And, and well, first of all, tell us why you do it. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then give us some feel for how, how that proceeds. I guess first I can explain what I'm doing in terms of the, the technique I'm using. Like I, I see experimental evolution as a tool to to basically, you know, really answer the question that I'm interested in, which is what is the role history plays in evolution? But that is really the, the bigger question that I'm asking. And uh, I am coupling uh, microbial evolution experiments with um, whole genome sequences studies. So not only I experimentally evolve uh, microbial populations in the laboratory, but I also monitor the changes of these population and, uh, in their genome level using using really powerful uh, whole genome sequencing tools to really investigate evolution in action. Uh, I, I don't study yeast. I study uh, bacteria. Particularly, I study E. coli. Uh, I started using, um, my, for my experiments, I, I started my experiments with using a strain that Richard Lansky generously provided um, that is the initial strain that he also in, he initiated uh, this long-term evolution experiment that he's working with. You want to study ex- experimental evolution to understand the impact. You, when you say history, uh, mm-hmm. can you be more specific? What, what you know, geological history, um, mm-hmm. biochem, so, geochemical history, something. Well, so uh, well, I, okay. Experimental evolution studies really offer really key insights into problems that are, um, I think, deeply conceptual. Uh, for example, understanding understanding how mo- molecular innovations lead adaptations or vice versa. And uh, what are the mechanisms really that influence convergence evolution, if, if there is such thing, if that's the, that's the basis of, exper- of evolution. So experimental evolution allows us to set up a system in the lab where we can watch the bacterial bacterial populations. In my case, it's bacteria populations uh, changing, responding to the conditions that we set up a priori. So it's okay. a very powerful tool in that sense because I mean, of course, regardless, I mean, it's, it's important to emphasize that it is experimental. So it may never reach to the scale of you know what's right. going on right. in nature, but it does provide. Uh, it's a very close proximity or it, provide some insights to a degree. When you do experimental evolution, and you said you're trying to, for example, understand convergence, how does that fit in the bigger questions of astrobiology? Are you trying, you're trying to understand the evolution of life in, in a broader context than just life on Earth? So I, do, I actually um, don't only do experimental evolution, but rather I combine experimental evolution with another um, experimental tool, and that is ancestral sequence reconstruction. So in, in one level, I can evolve bacterial populations, say, from time time zero to time 
in some time in the future, and that is my um, evolution set in the lab. But I also edit the bacterial genome with with genes that with well, well, we call them as ancient genes that we infer using phylogeny. So what we do is really take what is existing in the bacterial genome and replace it with, it is, in my case, 500 million year old ancestor. So that there are two levels of time travel, really. One is that we go forward in time in terms of the bacteria populating every day, experiencing limited nutrients, and then going, going through bottlenecks every day. And then second level, we are introducing a, the inferred ancestor of the gene, of gene of our interest, and then monitoring how this ancient gene is responding to the rest of the genome as well as the, the, the whole bacterial system and also to the environment that we introduced it into. Okay. Uh, maybe a less technical way of saying inferred using phylogenies. I mean, you, you look at related organisms and try to understand what the common yeah. ancestor would look like. So in, in, in this specific case, uh, we, uh, we have resurrected uh, the bacterial ancestor, ancestral uh, proteins of elongation factor. So we only used a, uh, elongation factor is the name of the protein. So we only used a, a bacterial, bacterial species in this specific case. You sequence the gene uh, genome after it's evolved for a while? Yes. So we so what we did is we replaced the modern. I'm going to refer to it as the modern copy, the one that currently exists. We replaced the modern copy with a 500 million year old ancestral gene, and uh, that we we knew the properties of this 500 million year old gene in terms of its property in, in in vitro, meaning outside of the cell properties, like its melting temperature, the temperature that it starts to uh, lose its activity, optimal. Activity rather, and then doing this replacement caused the cells to be maladapted. One interesting thing about this protein is it's first of all it is an essential protein for the cell, meaning it is required for the cellular viability, and secondly, the the adaptive properties of the protein is uh, quite substantial. So if you, for example, go and isolate a, a bacterial population in from a hot springs. The, um, the elongation factor, the protein that you obtain from that population will directly um, reflect the temperature of its environment. So the elongation factor from our gut bacteria, E. coli, will start melting. Uh, the melting temperature of the protein will be, say, 37 degrees, which is it's directly adapting to our body temperature. And you see the similar environment. So the protein basically is highly adapted. So we are putting in a very highly adaptive protein, replacing the highly adaptive protein with this ancestor, and we are also putting it in a very highly adaptive organism, which is E. coli. So this initial change, given that the protein is extremely essential for the cell viability, caused the fitness of the bacteria to drop, meaning the bacteria can no longer grow as healthy as before. And we started from, from this sickness rather. So we took the sick bacteria and then we propagated the populations every day through serial transfers. Currently, we have about 3,000 generations and bacteria goes through about 6.6 generations per day. And then every 500 generations, we isolated uh, the, the genome of these populations and then we sent it off for whole genome sequencing. We mapped the exact location for each mutation and we asked the question of what, what happened. Did evolution um, repeat itself? Did the ancient gene um, maybe now does it is it did it evolve to be exactly like the offspring in terms of sequence or in terms of phenotype or did anything else in the genome change? What happened? I so that was the ultimate question. Yeah. Let me see if I understand why that has astrobiology implications. We really yeah. want to understand how adaptation works in general. Is that mm -hmm. is that yeah. really what so, you're getting at? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, we, we want to understand the, exactly the, the, the level of evolution, the, 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 the mechanisms for evolvability, what are the limits of uh, life really. Of course, in, 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 in this example, we are really limited by the way we define our system because it is a laboratory system. But the, the bigger picture is to understand the role history plays in shaping life. How much does the history affect the future, the future patterns that evolution takes? Are we limited? Or if, if, if there is such limitation, can we push the limits of history by going further back in time 
And if, and if there is a limitation, if it is the molecule limitation, can we engineer genomes in different ways so that we can overcome this limitation so that perhaps we can explore different adaptive pathways that maybe life is more diverse than we think. Maybe we can access those solutions. Yes, I, I understand. What, what's your long-term vision for this sort of research? Where do you think you can, you can go in terms of understanding adaptation to non, would it help us understand adaptation to non-terrestrial environments? Um, for example, like if uh, we want to understand the level of, uh, like, the, like the effect of uh, radiation, for example, in Mars, and if we were to set up, an, I would love to set up an, an evolution experiment in a very controlled way, I guess, uh, elsewhere in the universe, in a very defined planet, and Mars seems to be a perfect candidate for it. Or if we want to send an organism that is pre-adaptive to the, to the radioactivity, to the radiation, I'm sorry, conditions to Mars, experimental evolution would definitely offer a way. Oh, that sounds like a great idea. Of course, you'd have to get them back, right, in order to be able to... <laughs> Yeah, that's not my problem. I, I, just, I just want to design the organism for yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's the sort of thing I work on, so maybe I can get it back yeah. to you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah so that is my uh, vision in terms of astrobiology um, studies go, and I've been very fortunate enough to have NASA Astrobiology Institute uh, supporting me directly by through a NASA um, postdoctoral fellowship and as well as the NASA uh, exobiology and evolutionary biology program funding this study for the past four years. Now, I have a question from a listener. They wanted uh, a young scientist who wants to know, if you're interested in astrobiology, what, what should you study? What should you do? What, what's the best approach to becoming an astrobiologist? Or are there many approaches? Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, I think when I, when I look at the astrobiology community, I really realized that we are all interested. We are a bunch of people who are interested in almost everything. (laughs) And we really want to, I think, ask the questions that may never have an answer to, or we may never know what's going on. So I think the number one maybe requisite to, to number one requirement to, to be astrobiologist is to really keep the flame of curiosity alive and be thirsty to learn from every field. It is a very interdisciplinary field. And I think nowadays there are programs that offer even PhD programs in astrobiology. But definitely, I think having a, a, a basic background, like I have a PhD in chemistry, and I am now studying experimental biology and evolutionary biology. And I really benefit from having a, 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 a basic science uh, degree backing me up. But I would say that because it covers geology, physics, biology, really in any field, the, what you need to have is probably the curiosity and, and the boldness to ask the big question. I think that's what makes an astrobiologist an astrobiologist. Good answer. I, I, am, I will be biased because I am doing experimental work. I, you know, I, I'm combining biochemistry with evolution experiments, which I didn't talk about the biochemistry aspect yet. But I would probably see more... I probably see want to see more biology in astrobiology, and I think also maybe there has to be a big uh, more bridges that connects astro and biology of astrobiology. I uh, sometimes think maybe the the field is a bit divided: planetary versus biologists, or planetary versus more um, earth scientists. So I think I would like to see us a bit more connected. About a year ago, I spoke to David Grinspoon, who's working on a. Uh, mission to Venus. D- do you see much promise for uh, sample collection on Mars or Venus or other places like that? Would how how would how would we go about studying that sort of thing? I, I would I would be I would be very happy if I could have a chance to be involved in those studies. Definitely. I um, as I said, like um, pre adapting organisms, for example. For of course, these are you know you, we have to really carefully design these experiments. Right. Uh, right. I know a lot of. If any planetary protection people are listening to this interview, they may be getting like they may be hitting their heads in the wall now. As I'm ignorantly speaking about how much I would like to set up an experimental evolution system in Mars, but um, hey, why not? And and as long as it is you know under very strict controlled and predefined conditions, why not? And I I, I really think we will get there. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. think so. I, I I really do. We've probably already contaminated Mars to some extent. Well, I wouldn't say, hey, we already uh, destroyed it, so let's do it more. I wouldn't say that. But 
you know, I, I, I at least we, we learned from those mistakes. So we wouldn't uh, repeat the mistakes uh, that we've done before. So we would be very careful um, setting up those experiments. Now, if you got a sample of Mars rock, hmm. uh, ancient Mars rock back, what, what, do you, what sort of analysis would you want to be running on that, that rock? Well, of course, the, the ingredients, the contents, content analysis of the rock would be very exciting. But, I mean, I would, I, I, uh, because I don't know much techniques about how to analyze the rock, I would take it to JPL <laughs> directly. But I, I would want to know if there is any, um, any trace of, of course, any, uh, any cellular fossil, any, um, any, any kind of trace of it on the rock. That's the first thing I would want to see. Is there is there is there any molecular fossil anything on it? In all this talk of uh, sending humans to Mars, have you thought maybe you'd like to be one of the scientists to go to Mars? I like to purchase round trip tickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, not a one way trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I may wait a bit, but um, yeah, I mean, in 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 my. I am I am thirty now. If you ask me this when I was twenty, I would say yes. Now uh, I am, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it's very exciting, and I really am looking forward to uh, seeing what's going to happen. It's very very exciting to me. Uh, I mean, really, it's it's just uh, the only thing maybe that frustrates is like why isn't it happening sooner and faster? You know, why don't we do it now? You know? Yes. Yeah, so well, my generation went through that as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm fifty six and. And uh, so I, w- I was a, a little boy when they went to, started going to the moon, and I thought by now I would be, I would be standing on the moon myself. So uh, I understand the frustration. <laughs> yeah, I was talking. The, uh, I, I was uh, chatting with my husband the other day, and I was telling him that like uh, I remember drawing this picture of life as we vision in two thousand in the year two thousand, and I think uh, it was I was in uh, middle school, so it must be. Uh, 95, 96, and I was driving this flying cars. So year 2000 felt such as like crazy <laughs> space age. And, and I was thinking like, like now I'm thinking like, what was I thinking? It was just six years in the future. But of course, flying cars, you know, like, of oh, course, they're going to build it in six years. But, uh, but I think this century as a whole, if you think about it, is, is I mean, Talking like face to face with cameras was was a crazy idea only fifteen twenty years ago. So now we do it. So yeah, I expect crazy things to come in twenty years, technologically right. speaking. I, let me see if is there anything else you'd like to say about astrobiology or the future of astrobiology as a young scientist. I mean, my project is like it's very uh, it is experimental evolution, but. Like, I, I, which discipline or which meeting I go to, I always felt like an orphan because I never felt like I am. Astrobiology really is the only home I have. I feel like it's my home calling when I go to astrobiology conferences because everything else feels like I, I combine bits and pieces of a lot of disciplines. So um, that's to me always a challenge, of course, to explain because it is not just experimental evolution or synthetic biology or just biochemistry or whole genome sequencing. It is a com- combination of a lot of different tools. That's why I call it astrobiology. It fits perfectly. That's the spirit, rather. <laughs> you, know, you may be the first generation of scientists who, who feel that they're a natural astrobiologist and, and didn't come to it from, some, from outside. Probably. And that's why we, I think, like going back to the second, we, we realized that there are a lot of people who um, want to resurrect the field, too, or maybe create it, rather. Um, and and Sagan definitely provides that platform for uh, that kind kind of um, we we share our words and our interests and uh, we realize wow there is a lot of us and and here we are and we really want to uh, share our passion and I realize this in many astrobiologists that it's not just about doing the research in the laboratory or in the field but it's really communicating it with the public and I think a lot of us is very passionate about this not just with public but also um, middle school students, high school students, and early career scientists as well. So that to me is very, very, very special. I have never seen any discipline like this that really this heavily emphasizes the role the early career scientists will have to carry the flag forward. 
And I really appreciate this confidence, this trust that the NASA Astrobiology Institute has on us. Well, I'm, I'm ha- happy to do my small part to help you get your message out. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Paul. Bye-bye. Bye. An important goal for the WOW Signals Season 2 is to build a community around this podcast, and, of course, for that we need you. If you want to get involved with any of the episodes with a comment, a question, or by joining a roundtable discussion, then let us know. You can email wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com or go to the blog at wowsignalpodcast.com and leave a comment. You can also post on our Google Plus community or on our subreddit. Please see the links in the show notes. We hope to hear from you soon. And if you have just a little spare change and want to help support this podcast, you can do so at Patreon on a per-episode basis. Just go to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash wow signal for details even a small amount will help if you pledge five dollars per episode we'll send you a t-shirt or a coffee mug and just for one dollar an episode we'll publicly thank you on air please visit the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com for links and more information you can subscribe to this podcast on itunes or your favorite podcast aggregation service such as Stitcher or Pocket Cast, so you'll automatically get the new episodes as soon as they're out. Please, if you use iTunes, leave us a short review there. It's one of the best things you can do to help. That's all for this episode of The Wild Signal. We'd like to thank our guests Stephen Dick and Batul Kajar and the artists who let us play their music on the podcast. And now, here's musician and podcaster George Robb talking about just how big space really is with his song, Far. far. You ponder the universe and a look comes across your face. You try to fathom distances of all the stuff in space. But you can't wrap the bacon of your mind around the big Of all the terms required to describe how big is big So let me get specific And use words scientific Go whip out your thesaurus For this exacting chorus This stuff is far It's really far This stuff is far, far, far away And we're talking far Like far, far there by car in a day It's super duper crazy pharma Just pulsars, quasars, and stars I mean it's far, 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 far. If there's some doubt, listen to a shout This stuff is far It's for stars I sense all the explosions Going off inside your brain As your mind gets blown By what I just did explain Sorry if my words might drive you all insane But that's what happens when precision is your middle name Episode 4 of Season 2 of the Wow Signal Podcast This episode was written and produced by James Garrison and Paul Cox All spoken content of the Wow Signal Podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share a like license. Music was by DJ Spooky, Erica Lloyd, Shane Capriar, and George Hart. All music was either Creative Commons or presented with the permission of the art.
up some technical assistance And haven't caused your ticker too much ventricle resistance But you have got to listen and trust my insistence That I am very accurately describing the distance One more time This stuff is far It's really far This stuff is far, far, far away We're talking far Like Jamie Far Can't get there by car in a day It's super, super crazy far But I'm just pulsars, quasars, and stars I'm in it's far, 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 far.